Uh, when I was still in school, I, was, I had the opportunity to work at a laboratory. It was called the Laboratory for Computer Graphics and Spatial Analysis. Uh, while there, there was an executive director of that lab called Alan Schmidt. The second Lifetime Achievement Award will be for Alan. And I'd like to take a second and introduce you to him from my perspective. He started life as a chemist, became a geographer, became an urban planner, and then learned a little computer package called SIMAP. <laughs> yes, right. That was from the person who helped write it. <laughs> this was, this was a, the first computer mapping package built at Harvard University. Actually, it has some long history. But it was developed and thought about by a gentleman called Howard Fisher. Howard was the first director of the lab. Allen became his understudy, student, colleague, friend, and then took over the lab. At the lab, lots of people were burst and lots of people were influenced. People like, um, well, a lot, like me, and probably 40 or 50 other people here in the audience today. This year, they've all gathered at this conference to both acknowledge, acknowledge Alan for his contribution, and also they have a large exhibit here tonight I'd like to, to come and see about the old times at the lab. So there's a little personal thing going on here. Alan actually is not a flamboyant great speaker. He's a quiet fellow. He became my friend at the lab and he shared his work with me. He nurtured me and he also nurtured people like Scott Morehouse and Hugh Keegan and Dwayne Niemeyer and countless others at ESRI and other places who are here. I remember Alan mostly because he was kind to me. And if you're a graduate student, you know what it's like, most of you. <laughs> it's uh, outrageous, actually, what they make you do. <laughs> Alan nurtured me. When I decided to go back to California, he brought me into his office and gave me a long list of people he thought I should know. Business contacts, relationships, and actually, he helped me launch the whole vision of ESRI. In many ways, his spirit lives in the people that manage ESRI. I'd like to take a minute and have you join me in welcoming Alan Schmidt. He's going to share a few of the old times at the lab. Alan? Thank you, Jared. Thank you, Jack. Thank you for recognizing my lifetime achievements so far. Ed Popka once told me, while we're standing on the shoulders of others, indeed, I owe a great deal to those who have gone before or those who worked with me. My mentor at Harvard was Howard Fisher, the founder of the Lab for Computer Graphics, someone who I believe has not received his recognition that he deserves. Therefore, I'd like to take a few minutes to talk about Howard, if I may. Howard was a graduate of Harvard College in 1926. Then he went on to graduate school of design, study architecture for three years. He left after that to thinking about problems of prefabricated housing using metal construction and mass production. He spoke to the Pullman Car Company and said, you folks have a lot of experience in building houses on wheels, if you like. What can you help me learn about how I can apply this to building homes without wheels? Well, he also approached other firms, such as those who are involved in plumbing or millwork, glass, insulation, and such. And by 1932, he had a new company set up, which he established, called General Homes, to build prefabricated, mass-produced metal homes of the type you see in the illustration there. 
1933, he had a two-bedroom house on our market at $4,500. Remarkable. Being built with metal construction on a mass production prefabrication assembly line. Recognition of that work, he was made a fellow of the AIA in 1974. Well deserved, late recognition. Later on, Fisher became interested in city planning, his home, based originally, and the use of maps. He became a member of the faculty at Northwestern University in the Technology Institute. And he taught subjects there in civil engineering and problem solving in general. While there, he attended in 62 a course at the University of Washington offered by Edgar Horwood on his mapping system called Map 01, using Map on, on 1401 computer, makes some first maps. Which is interesting, but like other ladies, I can even improve on that, I think. He went back to Northwestern and working with Betty Benson, a programmer there, he developed the first version of SIMAP. SIMAP was, he thought, something he could use in his consulting practice for study planning in Chicago. SIMAP makes us maps on a line printer using print symbolisms like dots, dashes, O's, and V's and such in order to create a grayscale, if you like. The input to SIMAP is using line printer coordinates, which you obtain of a graph paper or with a ruler, such as you see in the lower left-hand corner there. And then you, of course, you have to digitize those. I mean, you have to use key punch. You'll know what key punches are, I'm sure. And you submit those in a batch process. If you're lucky, you might get a map out after a few more runs. Fisher began, also began offering a correspondence course on teaching his system, on a SIMAP system. And he had also two-day workshops where I first met Howard in, uh, in uh, AIP meeting. He was offering a, a two-day workshop. And at that time, he was also approached by the Ford Foundation and said, we'd like to support your work. We think it has real, real promise. Well, I had met Howard at this workshop in New Jersey at AIP meeting. And I also enrolled in his correspondence course. You could take it by correspondence or by, or by the two-day workshop. At that time, I was working in Louisville, Kentucky as a planner, my first job out of, out of school. And I learned later, Howard was approached by the Ford Foundation and said, we'd like to support your work. We think it got real potential for planners. And at the same time, Ford also approached other people, such as my subsequent co-worker at Michigan State University, who was doing a project on gaming simulation for mapping, I mean, for, for planning. And I went to join him there, Richard Duke, and I also bought SIMAP and got it running on the C3600 at Michigan State University. My job at Michigan State with Richard Duke and his gaming simulation project was to create a gaming simulation model which would represent the growth of the urbanized area over time. They said, well, let's, in order to communicate this to the game players, let's show them graphically. Let's make a, a film, perhaps. Let's make an animation. How Lansing grew from 1850 to 60, 1965. I went down to the state registry and I, with a bunch of students, and we recorded all the information, every single subdivision, 1850, 1850, 1965, where it was located by a section, range, and township. And I could then compute for every single section, range, and township how many subdivisions had been developed there and what percent of land was, was uh, now in the subdivision as a subdivision as a measure of the urban development. And I filmed that as a, as a time-lapse film, which I'll show you a version of here. Well, you can see this film at the display downstairs in, in the model, in, in, the, in the lobby. It's an interesting film because it shows how the growth of an urbanized area, in Nansen's case, is very dependent upon the transportation pattern. It shows how Lansing starts out as a very nuclear city in 1850, a very small, compact area, and it grows out kind of linearly along the urban transit line, and then turn of the century with coming automobile, Oldsmobile was built there, you know, up until this year, anyhow. And it grows out in a very linear fashion. And then after the Second World War, it just explodes on a screen. It's very dramatic when you see it in the film. Well, by 1965, Howard was at Harvard. He had taken his promise of a grant from the Ford Foundation and was made a professor in city planning at Harvard. 
in the, in the fall, in the spring of that year, by the fall, the grant arrived. He had three hundred thousand dollars, a little more than that, from the Ford Foundation to start the lab going. Then he had to find some way of of building that lab and uh, and staffing the lab. He did two things. He had lunch at the technical club. He would invite people to come in: geographers, city planners, architects, others might be potential staff members, and they could talk about their work there. He brought in Bill Warren, he brought in myself, he brought in Carl Steinitz, and many others to talk about their work. He also involved freshmen in the freshman seminar series. He would teach freshmen the CMAP process, and how they could then use the map for their own interest and their own applications. In the process, he got many very valuable contacts with freshman programmers, made very effective later employees of the laboratory. Here's an example of the correspondence course products or materials being developed at, at Harvard now. He brought them from Northwestern, we started them, now they're at Harvard, and they're being worked over by the Helen Mansfield, who was director of publications there at that time. And, and one day, Howard got a phone call from someone in the state. They said, we you stand opening up correspondence course? He said, yes, I am. He said, stop. I said, I beg your pardon. He said, you cannot offer a correspondence course in Massachusetts unless the state approves it first. You must cease and desist. Howard was livid. He said, no way. Forget about that. Harvard was here before you were here, Massachusetts. Therefore, we're, we're not going we're, we're to worry about your problems. And they went away. A few words about SIMAP. It made very effective, very low cost, very rapid maps, the kind you see here maps of both data zones and contour maps, which were unique. You can also make maps of any other size you specified. For example, you can make maps which are twice that size. Here's a map of Bangladesh and India at a two feet by two feet scale of population density by, done by um, one of the staff at Harvard. Here's a map that's five feet long of uh, Dalmarva, made by David Sinton and Carl Steinitz, using a variation of film called GRID, which was their version, which was scientifically working with gridded data as opposed to either uh, uh, polygons or, or contour lines. And here's a very unique map. Oops, went the wrong way. Here we go. Here's the first and only color map produced by CIMAP, by 1969, by Don, Donald Cook, a New England, New England Tennessee Youth Study. It was made by using colored carbon paper, and then run the paper back and forth through the computer, very baroque, but it could be done. He did it, the first one, first color map ever made by Donald Cook. Now, contour maps are nice, but if you can't see the information that contour represents, if you see the surface in perspective view, it's probably more informative, obviously. And we were able to get a program from Frank Renz at the University of Michigan, working with Waldo Tobler, came to Harvard, and we then began modifying that program further. But it's very effective for large data sets. For example, showing US population density is very valuable, as opposed to a contour map, this information almost, almost unintelligible. You see it in contours, see it in the surface, it's much more dramatic, much more informative. Towards the end of Howard's life, he was working on a book on graphic display of information. He was interested in particular on the role of the map maker in relation to the map sponsor. It was who's specifying that map's content. He said it's important to not only have the map designed to look good, but it has to have a message, has to have a purpose in, the, in, in, in its design. The form should follow the function of the map. He also pointed out the need to be aware that maps can lie. He said someone should write a book about how to lie with maps. He didn't do it himself, but said someone should. And indeed, must be aware always of the ethical issues of maps that they're not misused for the, for the wrong purposes. Well, after Howard passed away, um, Bill Warren was leading the lab for a number of years, and I took over after that. And we were getting contracts and grants from the ONR, in Bill's case, and National Science Foundation, in my case, with the help of Tom Poiker and uh, Nick Christman getting an NSF grant, and I got a grant from NSF for the conference we ran to support that work. And we also were involved in doing application work for a variety of contracts for government agencies and others. We also were running conferences, much as Howard had done, 
and we're also distributing our software and our databases and our publications. And with that, we were able to maintain enough income to support the laboratory. The most important thing we did, though, as far as research, was our work in data structures. Building upon the work of the Census Bureau and the DIME file, I was able to actually develop complete mapping systems which have topological structure to them, which allow us to do such things as polygon overlay for the first time. We had a project with the Defense Mapping Agency that said, we have this data set which shows land use in one data set, floodplain boundaries in the second data set, and contour lines in the third data set for elevation. So we want to be able to combine these and then extract data by using set theory and selectively extract and analyze the data. So we can't do that. We can try that, and we did, and we were doing it successfully. It's the first successful use of polygon overlay on a vector, vector data set to our knowledge and to their knowledge as well. Very proud of that project. It was one of our most successful and dramatic benchmarks we had for Odyssey software. Well, several laboratory members are here today, as, as Jack pointed out, and they are, our most, they are far more important than any products we had to people and their ongoing contribution to the field. And I'm going to thank them all today for all their contributions. I'd also like to be able to show you a brief list of all those members in rough chronological order. It's a list put together by Jeff Dutton back in 83, from the first to the last employee of the laboratory. And these folks are here today. Let's get past this one that we had that. There we go. Recognize those names, I'm sure you do. 52 is a very interesting name. It's coming up on the next screen. He's a good student, very good student, very promising student. Scott Morehouse is 136. <laughs> Nick Crispin's on there. <laughs> now, I'm sorry to say one person is not on there, and I'm kind of ashamed of that because I just, just missed it. Well, I guess it wasn't on, on Jeff's list either, and that's Dennis White. The reason I'm so concerned about that is, is that Dennis was the last person standing at the laboratory when the laboratory kind of dwindled down. So sorry about that, Dennis. I'll get it corrected next, next issue. The last thing I want to say, uh, this by the way is a source of other information besides the exhibit downstairs, it has that, the operational time-lapse film of Lansing. Upstairs. Upstairs, beg your pardon. Thank you, Nick. But uh, my closing comment is something which I learned from Jack, is that for every gentleman who's successful in his endeavors, he probably has a very successful wife behind him. And I need to be certain I recognize my wife's contribution to my work. Thank you, Alan. We should very much. Thank you all the laboratory employees. Thank you, Jacob. Lovely. Yes. Even in this presentation, he's self-effacing and humble. I really love this guy. <laughs> and a lot, of, a lot of his students do as well. Thank you, Ellen. Very welcome. It's my, my pleasure. Great, great pleasure. Same here, buddy. Thank you. Thank you.